I'm very grateful to the graduate students who have organized this series of events about the globalization of legal education for giving me a chance to give a little talk. Uh, I think it's an amazing project. And the way I understand it, what they're interested in having us sort of think about and talk about is two basic aspects. One is the emergence of global legal education as a new, relatively new phenomenon. And the second is the question of the role of the United States and elite American law schools in that process. I want to introduce two dimensions of alleged crisis. I, I think it's, it is a kind of crisis that are being um, much talked of by the people who think that there is something we need to start thinking about in the mode of the global legal educational question. One of these crises is a domestic American legal crisis, and the other is not exactly a crisis. It's a dramatic set of developments in the world legal services scene. And then I'm going to suggest that when we understand these crises basically as raising complex issues of distribution, among different economic actors, we can see that the global initiatives that are being undertaken by elite American law schools look actually somewhat plausible, like dimensions of the struggle of the among the core capitalist powers for imperial reach and hegemony in a changing world economy. So that's a one sector. The second thing is the, I'm going to try to do is to raise the question of how a person with, who is identified in a very basic way with the idea of the progressive or the left ought to regard the Americanization process as it is unfolding. And there I'm going to suggest that from a progressive point of view, there's a lot to regret or to feel a lot of reservations about the efforts of elite American legal institutions to globalize and the ways in which they rationalize that as not reinforcing world capitalist hegemony, the ways they rationalize that aren't very convincing. The world financial crisis and the American financial crisis have had an impact in accelerating dramatically already long-standing trends in the American legal profession. And now I'm going to list a bunch of them. The first one is a transitional moment that is a very substantial number of people who graduated from law school in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, and have had enormous difficulty finding work, especially for people below the level of the top 10 or 20 schools. A significant portion of them haven't found law jobs as much as two years or even three years now after graduating. So there is a transitional group who the crisis has radically affected, they have very large loans. They often have $150,000 or $200,000 worth of student loans. It's very possible they won't be able to uh, pay them, and they'll have to find alternative employment or accept very much lower level of legal employment than they hoped for when they graduated from law school. That group, those people are victims, and it's they're not an insignificant group if they're 45,000 law students graduating every year, approximately. and you know, 10 or 15 or 20 percent of them are having serious um, problems. We ought to feel bad about that and think about, you know, what the responsibility is for what happened to them and so forth. But I'm not mainly going to talk about them, but rather about the impact for the future of the event that's represented by their employment difficulties, the implications for the future. And there the idea seems to be, I'm not, I'm not just trying to say what I've been told this is not my independent research. There are three different trends in the legal profession that have been intensified and accelerated by these events. First of all, the crisis produces intense preoccupation with costs for the large enterprises, the American multinationals, but also just the large American corporate and financial sector in general become very preoccupied with their costs in a very severe economic downturn. And one of the ways to target costs is to target their legal costs. In the background, the legal profession appears to have reaped very significant rents 
from the provision of elite legal services, but legal services in general, based on their market position, the need for large corporations to be able to say that they've got the best legal representation, means that whoever is reputed to be the best can charge absurdly large amounts of money because there are many different buyers who want the best. So there's a rent to pure, a pure rent to reputation, which doesn't reflect anything about the costs of providing the service, but just about the desirability of being able to say, we use the best. In that system, there has been a long-standing preoccupation, so it appears, of these large clients with the fact that they're paying 500 or more dollars an hour for the services of associates who basically have no training and the associates are being paid 100, 110, 120, a lot of money to provide the services. And it looks like from the point of view of the client that it's hard to justify um, that dimension of it. That produces the training issue in which the client says, we're paying you to train your associates. And the firms say, we are paying the law, the law school, they're paying for law school, and law school doesn't, in fact, provide the training. So the students are going gigantically into debt. We have to pay them a lot of money, but they're untrained. So therefore, the law school should do something about training. That's one dimension. A second aspect that's accelerated is the preoccupation with costs leads to the idea of splitting up the provision of legal services by fragmenting the service and uh, it's the principle of the division of labor. It's totally Adam Smith. So some people are just putting the head on the pin rather than a single workman making a whole pin in a handcrafted way. Let's take the person doing document review and uh, spin it off to people who will be paid much, much less than associates to do document review, possibly overseas. Uh, let's spin off many other, what it's the, the paralegal movement was the beginning of this many, many years ago, but it's paralegality raised to a new very high level. So many people will specialize in providing much less skilled legal services, and they will be paid much less money than the generalist associate in the elite firms. The third dimension that's accelerated is the disaggregation of the firm as a unit, which is not necessarily implied by the specialization thing. You could keep all the lawyers inside the firm, but this is a more general phenomenon in which the basic bottom line is that firms dissolve, firms reform. There's a constant process of, of disaggregation and agglomeration reflecting the entrepreneurial skills and activities of individual partners and the human capital assets of the lower level workers who are hired, fired, and reallocated according to the vagaries of the market for legal services as it's understood by the people who are the entrepreneurs. So these three developments mean that, uh, among other things, the prospects for people beginning law school at relatively low status, by this I mean everything below, say, the top 20 firms, their prospects are less good. Their chances of repaying their loans at the current rate they have to borrow at to get through law school are significantly reduced. Their prospects of employment are much more chancy than they were before. And the question of what they need in the way themselves, what they think they need in the way of training to succeed in the profession, shifts quite dramatically. They can no longer be sure that law schools know how to give them what they need in order to succeed professionally. So law school is a less, what, obviously desirable alternative for something to do if you wish to move up the social and economic ladder for it's a social mobility question, there's that aspect. But even for people who are securely middle class, to start with, the question of whether they should go this way, if they can't get into an elite law school, should they, in fact, not go to law school at all? So the legal dimension of the lives of the multinationals is strikingly large. It involves 
the relationship between the multinationals among each other, they fight it out through lawsuits of various types uh, against each other. It involves their relationship with the governments from which their ownership is derived, where they produce and where they sell, where the, they're constantly dealing with the regulatory efforts of nation states or even international organizations to keep under control their relations with their others. It involves their labor relations. A very large labor forces are indirectly as well as directly employed by the multinationals. They don't generally do factory production themselves, but millions of workers produce for them. And then finally, it involves their relations with NGOs. And the NGOs are going to be an important part of the story later on, but the NGOs preoccupied with human rights, environmental protection, uh, and labor rights are uh, constantly, we might say, nipping at their heels or irritating them like mosquitoes and have to be fought off and dealt with through basically legal means. So this is a highly legalized universe. The multinationals employ very large numbers of lawyers who are overwhelmingly organized in very large transnational law firms. Those law firms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In this situation, the interests of the United States have been enormously reinforced by the dominance of transnational law by American law firms. Those law firms, of course, initially staffed overwhelmingly by the products of elite American law schools. That situation couldn't last forever, just as there was the rise of Western Europe after World War II and then of the semi-peripheral countries, Brazil, uh, India, Russia, and then of China, challenging the economic dominance of the United States in world markets. So there was going to be a challenge to the dominance of American law firms and indirectly of American legal education. That happened first by the generalization of the American transnational law firm model so that not just American law firms and the American law firms became themselves more internationally, internally complex, producing a new configuration which looks like multinationals. The law firms now look like the multinationals that they service. They're owned from a variety of places, they operate in a variety of places, and their staff is multinational, just as is true of the corporations they service. So in that context, it's obviously another possibility for rising, for Western European and other rising economies to provide legal education. There's legal services to be provided and there's legal education to be provided to the people who will provide the services. So there is to be anticipated a new kind of struggle with respect to the dominance of the international legal arena. Already, already, it's far faded compared to what it was 20 years ago. But in the legal educational domain, that has not been altogether true. It's been true consistently that you need some American legal education to be a player in one of these transnational law firms. And they urge their associates to do a master's, for example, as a condition of continuing. And also, there's a in order for to support the career hopes of Western European and also now semi-peripheral lawyers, they would be better off if they weren't at a disadvantage in dealing with the transnational law firm as a result of their legal education. So now the question becomes, what is it about the American legal educational system that differentiates itself uh, from the typical legal educational systems of the countries that are challenging the U.S. economically? And there's a relatively simple answer to that, which is that the Amer American legal education differentiated itself after World War II from legal education in the rest of the world by its attempt to incorporate policy analysis. So it's a very, very simple thing. Policy analysis is something that was foreign to the ethos of civilian legal education, but also of British and Anglo Commonwealth common law education. Policy was equally foreign in both traditions for all kinds of complicated reasons, 
which include legal realism, American federalism, the low quality of the American judiciary, the openness of the American bar, the politicization of law, the legalization and politicization uh, in the U.S. context, this American development occurred, and it's enormously, turned out to be enormously useful. It turned out to be practically dominant of the relatively formalist legal educational ethos generated outside the United States. So then the question becomes, if you want to compete with the Americans, this dimension is pretty important to master. If you want to compete to provide the people who will serve the multinationals, allowing the multinationals to dominate their various opponents, then you need to provide them, or it's ideal to provide them, this kind of legal education. Partly intrinsic advantages, but also partly just because it's the ethos. Whatever the ethos is, you've got to be able to play on that basis. So what that means is that there is a motive for rivals of American legal education to arise to serve their nationals who will become participants in multinational governance of the world economy. And indeed, there is the lawyerization that everyone is talking about, 300,000 Chinese lawyers by 2025, We're talking about the enormous expansion of Brazilian legal education. So the background conditions are ideal for a battle of dominance of the global legal education between Americans and the rising powers who are providing a large part of the personnel for the newly expanded world of transnational law. The providers of legal services, the law firms, and the trainers of legal, serv of legal servants, that is, the uh, law schools, particularly the elite law schools, they have a role to play. They're not the most important people in the system, but they do have a significant role. And so it's an interesting question, how should a person who sees the system of global governance as having a profoundly imperial or neo-colonial quality and a deeply exploitative quality and often a very cruel quality, how should one feel about the ways in which uh, American law schools battling for a market share in provision of world legal education, uh, how should one feel about their enterprise to actually assert themselves transnationally? Well, I think that for many people on the American elite legal education side, when they think about this enterprise of globalizing American-style legal education, they, they do recognize that to a significant extent the American legal educational system will be in the service of the multi of the law firms that are turned in the service of the multinationals. But their experience of it is that that dimension about which they might have reservations is significantly redeemed by another idea that they have about what's good about American legal education and American law. I think they think that the globalization of the American model of corporate law is also the globalization of the American model of human rights advocacy, the support of environmental law, of NGOs in civil society being served by lawyers who come from this same background. And they think of that as a way in which one could say it's better for American law to globalize because of its greater concentration on the provision of this kind of actual pushback against the power of the multinationals. Also, I think they think of the American tradition in legal education as strongly supporting actors who push back against governments all around the world that are abusive of human rights. So they think that it's good for us to be the purveyors of um, legal education for those who will service the multinational, the law firms who will service the multinationals, because it's balanced in some sense. It's balanced by the, so to speak, the goody-goody side of the production of lawyers in this system. I don't think that's crazy. I think there's some sense in which it's true that the, Ameri the emergence of 
and development of American legal education after World War II has had a stronger element of emphasis on everything from human rights to clinical to civil rights, all the different ways in which lawyers can service NGOs or act directly to push back against the dominance of I think there's a large sense in which that's all good. However, it seems to me it's just a fig leaf. It's a tiny factor compared to the contribution of the elite law schools to supporting, fueling, developing, reinforcing the dominance of the multinationals. This dimension is not very significant. It's true that there are jobs in that, and there will be jobs in that, and people trained in this system are exposed to the possibility of having that kind of job. But the idea that the world system represents a kind of balance between economic rationality, the interests of the multinationals on the one side, and more public interest represented by NGOs with their legal advocates on the other, and it's a sort of um, contest in which we would think that some reasonable accommodation between conflicting interests but also conflicting policies, say economic development and efficiency against human rights or the environment, that there's a kind of reasonable balance that emerges from the system is, I think, really way off. I mean, it doesn't correspond in any way to the way I see it. So. To summarize, the first point is that the process of generalization of American legal educational techniques and ideas is likely just to reinforce the powers and capacities of the multinationals in their contests with all the people who oppose them, people with whom I tend to be more sympathetic, actually, than I am with the multinationals. But that's just the first point. And now just let me make clear, Americanization doesn't mean that Harvard Law School dominates Vargas. Getulio Vargas or something like that. Americanization means that the model of policy analysis, the model of relatively small group instruction, full-time law professors who play a significant role in developing policy analysis, both for governments and for corporations. That's the model that I'm talking about. A second downside of that model is that the form of policy analysis that dominates American legal education is from up to my mind essentially status quo oriented or even reactionary because the aspects of policy analysis that are understood as most prestigious all take it for granted that there is a very large interest in efficiency, development and growth within the existing system of radical inequality and hierarchy and in fact in um, the integration of the whole world into the world economy on the existing terms, which are basically enormously unfavorable to any to all of the periphery, and where the semi-periphery has only begun to be able to master its position. So the form of policy analysis is based on the idea, as I said, that efficiency and growth are overwhelmingly important policies and pursuing them at the expense of all the other conceivable counter-interests is disfavored in the analytic. So that's just built-in bias in favor of the policy interests of the multinationals. Then a third downside of this mode of education is that it's training for hierarchy in a characterological and spiritual way, as well as in terms of the policy substance and the political valence of the use of the services by the multinationals. By saying that it's training for hierarchy, what I mean is that the relatively more personal, small group organized, the relatively more intimate and interactive nature of the training process has built into it a disciplinary, in Foucault's terminology, a deep disciplinary element in which young lawyers are trained to identify in a way that I think is actually not socially desirable with the authority of their elders, who will be first the professors and then the senior partners, and to submit and internalize the ideology of the system as one in which they will get their satisfaction by being the hired guns, doing the best and most intense conflictual interaction or the most elaborately effective planning for the multinationals with very, very little sense of themselves as autonomous moral and political actors. At least that's my impression. That's a big generalization, but it's my impression. So 
that's partly a product of the fate of American legal education, which has had two dramatic instances of left rebellion against this type of characteristics of the profession. That's legal realism and critical legal studies. So I am obviously a representative of the critical legal studies moment of rebellion against the working of the system, a moment that's been over now for a good 20 years. So I'm really not saying that there is a critical legal studies movement today that exists in legal education, but there's an archive. There's an archive of realist and crit work articles. There's still networks that exist of scholars who are still pursuing those agendas, not as an organized movement, but trying to develop the critique of the system, that is the system of world governance by the multinationals, the critique of the services that lawyers provide in assuring the dominance of the multinationals, the critique of the substance of legal education as policy analysis, and critique of legal education as training for subservience and willing participation in uh, the system. And that archive is available. Now, I don't think it it's a, a vast saving grace of globalization that those things will be available. But I think it is something. It's good that they're available. And so my one bright side is that more people in the global south may, as a result of these processes, have the chance to have a look at what we've contributed to how they might resist. Of course, resistance is local. There is no resistance that's not grounded in the local experience of rebellion against the oppressiveness of the local system. And all I can say is that against the process of the globalization of the American model, we can hope that there will emerge new forms of resistance, new ways of fighting back, and they will produce new ideas, hopefully cannibalizing the resistant ideas that are there to produce things that will be surprisingly um, fresh and hopeful.